Hola, 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 hola. Acá te vamos a ver. Shall we start now? Hello. Hello. If you can go ahead, sir, we can hear you clearly. If you can hear me, sir, we can go ahead, we can hear you very, very clearly. All right. This morning, we are studying on the sub building the tabernacle of David. This is the first part. Uh, the second part of Our reading of the scriptures come from Acts chapter 15, beginning at verse 14. Chapter 15, beginning at verse 14. Simon has declared how God had visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people from and with this, the words of the prophet, just as it is written, after the and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild it and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord all these things. Verse 18, known to God from eternity, all his works. Now, just read, is part of a story. This chapter begins with and his friend Barnabas, who sent to minister to the... Now, while they were there, some Jews from came there and began to say that in addition, Paul and his friend were teaching that also needed to be circumcised so that their salvation was complete. This caused quite a bit of problem and they, the two of them carried this problem to Jerusalem, Jerusalem to see the leaders of the church so that this matter will be resolved. In the middle of this discussion, this particular building, the Tabernacle of David, was not on the agenda. They were discussing the matter of the Gentiles, but God himself interrupted them and threw in this word as part of his agenda. Please take note of this particular point that I've just made. This matter of circumcision for the Gentiles was the end of the meeting. But God, through this agenda, and brought this uh, prophetic word through uh, the man who spoke. Simon declared, has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets are just 
acting and so on and so on and so on. James, who spoke, was the younger brother of Jesus Christ after the flesh from the same mother. Now, this word that was spoken contains one, two, three, five promises. In fact, that's the sixth one. The first is, I will return. The question of whether Jesus was going to return was not part of the agenda. But he says, I will return. I will rebuild the, the ruins. I will set it so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name. Now, please notice that David in the Old Testament in First chapter 15 and First Chronicles chapter 16, verses 1 to 6, had tried to take this act back to Jerusalem and eventually all the things that happened. Now, David moved this act from its original place and moved it to Jerusalem and put tent curtains over it in First Chronicles chapter 17, verse 1. Now, the ark represented the presence of God. The ark, please, represented the presence of God. So by bringing the ark to Jerusalem, the capital city, to the seat of government, David was doing a prophetic act. David was doing a prophetic act. He did not just want to continue to go to Gibeon to worship and to consult God through the priests, but now he wanted the presence of God representing, represented by the ark to be in Jerusalem, the capital city where the judiciary, the executive, the legislative, and everything the king was. As it were, he wanted God to oversee the seat of government. He wanted God to see and oversee the seat of government. In other words, this is bringing God to the seat of government, to the marketplace, to the workplace, to the engine room of the nation. That was what David was doing by bringing the ark of God into Jerusalem. And let's ask the question, what is the message for us as leaders so far in this story? We need to know that God will want to do this act of bringing and manifesting his glory in the marketplace, in the workplace, in the place of governance, in the place of authority, in every nook and corner of society by this act. We need to know that God will want to do this through the Gentile church. Why the Gentile church? Because in Acts chapter 15, the Gentile church was the center of focus. The matter of whether the Gentile church belonged to the church as the Jewish church belonged to the church was discussed. And the poison of um, you must be circumcised in order to be fully uh, qualified to be saved was discussed. But just as that matter was being closed up, God brought this agenda and said, look at this, I will return. 
I will rebuild. I will uh, rebuild the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up and so on. Now, let us read the context. You see, it is important to notice that this promise was given by God through prophecy. The prophets who heard it kept it in their minds and through their words, they you know, spoke these words of prophecy to other prophets. Until this man, um, until this man, James, heard it and then said it in the midst of this apostle. He didn't say it as a suggestion. He said it as a ruling. He says, look, this is what God now wants to do. Now, let me say this. You see, we need to prepare ourselves, each one of us. After preparing ourselves, we need to position ourselves. And after positioning ourselves, we need to present ourselves as vessels through whom God will do this work. Now, how do we begin to do that? Let me give you an example from the Old Testament. Let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 8. This will give us a proper picture of 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 8. It will give us a very clear picture of how to prepare ourselves. It says there, Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you, setting you on his throne to be king for the Lord your God, because your God has loved Israel to establish them forever. Therefore, he made you king over them to do justice and righteousness. You see, for example, this was the word which the queen of Sheba shared with Solomon when she came to visit him as a leader. Now, let us take this verse into pieces to understand how it applies to each and every one of us. First of all, blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you setting you on his throne to be king with the Lord your God. Each of us has to have a heart of thanksgiving. Whatever we do, wherever we are, wherever God has placed us, we need to ask God. We need to look at God. We need to relate to God with the heart that blesses the Lord. Blessed be the Lord your God. Number two, God is the one who has delighted in us to make us who we are, whether we are registrar, whether we are bank director, whether we are uh, managing director, whether we are chief executive, whether we are bank manager, whether we are doctor, a lawyer, whatever it is that we do, it is God who delighted in us. Because if he didn't delight in us, we would be nothing. Number three, setting you on his throne. Now, for example, right here, I'm sitting on a chair and this is my study and I walk from here. So also a bank manager will sit on his seat in his office and operate from there. The same thing, a doctor will sit in his uh, chair, in his uh, consulting room and walk from there. Even the housewife will sit on her small chair in the kitchen to prepare food for the household. So whichever chair you sit on is an extension of the throne of God. So wherever you sit in the marketplace, in the place of governance, in the place of administration, in the place of work, whatever it is that you do, that seat from which you operate, God set you there. And that seat 
is an extension of God's throne. Very important. And whatever he has made you to begin to do from there, to be king, to be leader, to be pharmacist, to be engineer, to be a bank director, to be principal, to be vice principal, to be whatever, to be king for the Lord your God. Now, you are what you are. It is God who set you there. And that chair that you're sitting on is an extension of God's throne. So that while you're there, you are whatever it is you are for the Lord your God. Your first line of responsibility is to God. Yes, somebody may have promoted you there. Somebody, some people must have maybe elect, may have elected you to that place. Maybe you inherited that place, that chair by inheritance, whatever it is, however you got there. But try and understand that you are first and foremost responsible to God. Now, look at number five. It says, because your God has loved Nigeria, because the Lord your God has loved Israel, because your Lord has loved the people whom you serve, that is why he made you, he gave you that position to be to be a nurse, to be doctor, to be lawyer, to be whatever it is, because your God has loved Nigeria. Now, notice, he says, the next reason is to establish them forever. The reason God has made you who you are is to establish the people forever. Therefore, he made you king, he made you doctor, made you engineer over them. And in the final analysis, number seven, therefore he made you king over them. He made you engineer over them. He made you doctor over them to do righteousness and justice. When we look at your work, when we look at the way you do your work, we examine it. When God looks at it, he wants to see righteousness and justice. He wants to see righteousness and justice. That is how we prepare ourselves. Now, if everybody has this mindset and continues to work like this, to prepare themselves to produce like this, to have this mindset, to do righteousness and justice, then we are prepared. And then that will put us in the position to do exactly what God wants to do. Now, we need to bring the presence of God as we are prepared. And what do we do? We need to understand that each one of them, each one of us, each one of your members, each one of your brothers and sisters, each one of the church, each one of us Christians, we need to bring the presence of God by working to bring the values of God. We need to read the scriptures. What are the values that God operates by? What are the standards that God expects? What is the wisdom of God that God needs, that God uses in doing whatever he wants us to do? What is the power of God that is at work there? So we need to understand that, number one, we need to bring the presence of God broken down into the values of God, the standards of God, the wisdom of God, the power of God into every institution so that if somebody comes and looks at 
this study from which I work and looks at my, produ my production, the work that I do here, the studies that I do, the ministry that I ordained, that uh, God has ordained for me, the work that I do, my presentation, everything, they need to see the values of God, the standards of God, the wisdom of God, the power of God. In the legislature, in the executive, in judiciary, in whatever it is, wherever it is that we work, we need to have the values of God, the standards of God, the wisdom of God, and the power of God. Bring all of this into the institutions to strengthen them, to make them what they were supposed to be, what they were supposed to do, to achieve the purpose for which they were set up so that we can rebuild our country, we can rebuild our own bit of Nigeria. Now, let me say this. We need to understand that we also need to bring the character, the wisdom to the workplace. Usually, we've suffered from a division of our mentalities too. We think of one side as spiritual, as secular. Sunday, we go to church, we fast, if possible, we sing, we listen to the word, all the things that are spiritual. And then from month, we then do what is secular. Work, there's no God in it most of the time. We don't it is, we don't treat it as if God is in us. This is work now. This is money now. This now. This is not Bible. This is not Christianity. This is not church. No. Please, that must stop. We've got to make of God the standards of God, the power of God must be carried on pushed into institutions. And we've got to then bring the character, the power of God into the workplace. How do we do this? Now, go to Isaiah chapter 50. And we want to read that verse 12. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 12. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 12. Now, it says there, those from among you shall the old waste places, the foundations of many generations, and you shall the repair of the breach, the restorer needs to dwell in. Now this is for a nation, an institution, whatever. Now, those from among you, of all, we are people who have ourselves, we have people who have ourselves, and we're not people who manifest and do the work of the Lord. Those from among you shall build the old up the foundation generations. You shall be called the parents of the bridge, the restorer of the streets. Now look around. First of all, beginning. Maybe, maybe that which you work, maybe over which you have jurisdiction. What are the old pieces there? What are the old pieces there? 
places that have gone to waste that are in need of building. What have been destroyed and need to be rebuilt, raised up. Places where there are breaches, where things what are the places where we need to restore? And of course, the Spirit of God alone, if we seek Him and walk, walk by Him, He will point this out. The wisdom as we listen, as we share, how to do it. Let me share bit from my wife's testimony. We moved into our new house a little over a year ago. It was being built. She said she wanted a small at the back of it where she had a few things. Now, when we got here, we found out that the guy had been prepared, but they had used bits and pieces of old of cement and broken into that portion. So the thing was hardly useful in planting. So she brought in uh, workmen. In some cases, they had to move the uh, bits and pieces of block, smash them, and broke them, and then eventually pour topsoil on top of the place enough for a garden. Put topsoil, she put black sand, she put cement, she put uh, manure, and so on. Eventually, we could plant vegetables. We could plant, you know. Then our son and walked around the place and said, "No, I will do something." He spent a bit of money, a lot of a bit of money, but brought in a professional gardeners, some net over the place. It put stills, put all kinds of things, made a greenhouse. Today, when you walk inside that place, go there, get you know vegetables to prepare our food, various things that grow there. I don't want so that you probably don't want to. Don't come and disturb me wanting that. But good, beautiful things are growing there. Being all sorts of vegetables. You know? So this is of restoring and rebuilding waste places, raising the foundations of many and so on. And round quite a few things have been done um, to repair breaches and so so that when you come into the place, you know that this is a beauty. So we need and my brothers and sisters that what we're discussing this morning is this. God wants to the church to rebuild every place the body of Christ was. It's not something that um, a plan. We'll discuss plan tomorrow. You know tomorrow. When we prepare ourselves, we put ourselves in that 
we are now prepared, guided by God to, by God to be in God. And when we see some, how to do it, what to do, it, how to put it properly, to come to us. Understand that. Now, also that look at the world as it is. Various things have changed. Is it society? What is it that is not damaged? And we need to understand that we will do a bit of it so that in the world will see things and say, ah, God is worthy of worship. We've got to follow him. Of what God wants to do. It's not just speaking and, and saying, be safe, come to Jesus, give your lives to Jesus Christ, prepare yourselves to go to heaven, wonderful, but we will on this earth by the Holy Spirit, as we have prepared ourselves, as we continue, we will repair such things, we would, whatever it is, Police, the, the, if, if a Christian is in charge of a branch of the police, God, you will restore that branch of the track criminals, use the to break their gangs up, whatever it is that criminals use, and that the wisdom of God is superior to what that they do. The power of God is whatever satanic powers that they used to or they used to operate. All of that is involved in the early part of last century when Christian police officers in America decided to go after the mafia in America at that time the, if you like, number two government. They were the shadow government. But these Christian army officers, by the spirit of God, went after them from their highest to the lowest and smashed them. And today, the mafia is only a very, very, very pale shadow of itself. And in terms of repairing all sorts of breaches in various parts of the country, you discover that uh, by the wisdom of God, the children of God who were alive in those days and who were conscious would were able to do all the things that were needed to be done. Now let me close today. It's important that we understand that each of these statements we will need to learn and we will need to understand and we will need to apply, learn, understand, apply the values of God. What is the reason why you do anything. For example, you want to start a project. Is it just to make money? Is it to be rich? Is it that your name will be heard? Or is it to make sure that people's lives are made easier, better? Is it that life, you know, as it is, you know, becomes better in, you know, in the present situation, the values, the standards of God. Now, for example, you look at a Mercedes. A Mercedes has 
a three-pronged star inside a circle. When you look at the Mercedes, the first thing, if you're used to Mercedes, is, is that star correct? If it is the real Mercedes, you can be sure that it will not leave you on the road. It's quality. Is it a watch? If it is a watch, check whether it is a proper Swiss watch. If it is a proper Swiss watch, Swiss watch then you can depend on it. There are nations that are known for certain standards. Standards. You can close your eyes and use their product. You can be sure. It's not well now that there's a lot of uh, all sorts of uh, fake goods that, you know, some of these other countries are brought into the uh, nations and now use maybe their motors and their whatever to uh, patch them up together. No. Now, when you look at certain things, certain products, and you look at the wisdom with which, you know, God endowed men to do things like this, the wisdom. I don't, I'm not a scientist, but you discover that when you look at certain products, you look at certain processes, you understand that it has to be God that gave people wisdom to do this. It has to be God. Now, we are going to go into all of those aspects of work and production so that the power the glory of God will be seen and manifested. Now, to achieve the purpose for which the institutions were set up. You know that um, in many countries, we find that governments have in mind a purpose and that purpose is stated, that purpose is probably written down and it is budgeted and so on and so forth. And before you know what is happening, money goes somewhere else. The purpose for which that plan was made, that appropriation was made is now gone even generations that come after will never know that that was the purpose, that was the reason why that uh, broad project was even thought of. So we've got to understand that the purposes for which projects and things were incubated, were set up, will be seen, will be known. And if in this, if in this uh, state of mind of our preparedness, we work with the purpose of God, when people see those purposes or those products or those things, uh, people will say, praise the Lord, look at this, you know, uh, wonderful people. So we've come to the end of today. Ash. We, we've come to the purpose of today, I mean, the end of um, today, and we've got to share in a word of prayer now to close this part, and tomorrow we'll be ready to go for the part two. I've tried to make it as practical as possible, as simple as possible. So let us pray. Our God and our King, we want to thank you for the grace of God. Give us your grace, O oh Lord. Give us your love. Give us your grace. Give us your peace. Give us your wisdom. Father, prepare us. Cause us to receive in our spirits 
the revelation of what you are planning to do, especially as you promised in Acts chapter 15 about rebuilding the tabernacle of David. Lord, we need to receive from you and we ask therefore now the grace, the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding to work with you, to be co-laborers with you, to work with you, to do your will, to rebuild the tabernacle of David. Father, we bless your name, we give you praise. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, as you teach us in our churches that we ought to live 24 hours before you in our minds, in our spirits, in our souls, in our bodies. Not just the one day out of the seven in which we gather in churches or in congregations to worship, to praise you, to pray, to read the word of God. But Father, we pray that our lives, 24 hours a day, would be totally given over to doing your will in every area to which you have called us. Thank you, our God and Father. We pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.